that uh, was chosen to be the speaker for his son's graduation. And uh, he had asked that they should experience pain in their lives. And uh, that was the headline. And, and when you got into the story, really what it was, he had taken a different approach. It was John Roberts, and uh, he had, uh, it was for his, his grade nine son's graduation. And he said uh, from his own life, uh, he needed to be honest with them, is that the uh, times when he had grown the most and learned the most were the times where he had experienced pain in his life. So if that's what it took for them to grow and to learn, then he wished for them to have pain. Kind of a different way of thinking and so on. But uh, interesting, that was three years ago. The grade nine class is now graduating and they're probably thinking, I wish he hadn't said those words. <laughs> Do you think? It's kind of there. And, and dear ones, uh, I am very mindful of the sermon that I'm sharing with you today. And like with the pastor that ministered to Padina, you know, only God uh, can do things. Uh, it's not humanly possible to heal anybody. Only God can do those things. So I certainly do not want to, to pre pretend that I'm speaking in God's place today. But I do know the scripture that speaks of a promise that all things work together for good, and, and especially pain, painful times in our lives. Uh, you see, we take for granted the good times. If you look back on the years of your life and all the happy times, I don't think you could write them down. But the hardships, oh, I give you a little bit of time. I bet you you can think of them this last week, can't you? You know, my sore thumb or, or things that didn't go right. Uh, C.S. Lewis, some of you may know his writings, Christian author, he wrote in the booklet, A Grief Observed. Uh, C.S. Lewis, these are his words. He says, after the death of his wife, he reflected that God was so present in the good times, but so absent in the bad. God is so, you're so present in all the good times, but you're so absent in the bad. It makes me think of, have you remembered that poem? Uh, the footsteps in the sand. Mm -hmm. It's like that, isn't it? Mm -hmm. God, you know, all my good times. Here, there's there's two sets of footprints, and we're together. But in the bad times, there's only one set of footprints. Where did you go? <laughs> and and you know the line, and and that's so true, isn't it? But we're so hard pressed to see that. In fact, you know what pain does is it isolates us from God and from one another. We hide from him, and we hide from one another. I'm more that way than B is. I'm an introvert when we've gone through hard times. I do just like to get in a corner and be by myself. You know, and she, right away, she wants the whole body of Christ uh, to be with her in prayer and so on. That's the way that she's made. And of course, that's the right way, isn't it? But I'll challenge you, uh, there's a tendency for all of us to want to hide. I go into the scripture, Adam and Eve, after they had sinned, you know what they should have said? Lord, I don't know what came over us. You know, we need you right now. What did they do? They hid. hid right? Well, that's, if you don't have a bed to hide under, well, you find a bush. Right? But that's human nature. A little child knows that. You've done something wrong. Well, where are you right? Animals even do. We used to babysit a dog, Peanut. We'd come back, and, and she knew she wasn't supposed to get into our food. Uh -huh. And we'd open the door, peanut. No peanut. Where was she? She was hiding. Why? <laughs> what did you do wrong? <laughs> right? It's, it's not rocket science. That's just human nature. And, and, and Job experienced it in the other way, in, in that he hadn't done anything wrong. It was just that the devil was on his case. One thing after another, after another, the family is gone. The crops are done. You are sick, sicker than a dog. Curse God and die. And, and Job was so embarrassed that, that, that he, he, he wanted to die. And, and all his friends left him. The ones that were left, you didn't want them as friends, right? If you know that book, 
the, the, they were making him feel even worse. And so when, when we go through painful times, the isolation is so much a part of it. In fact, you know, in prison, the worst thing they can do to you, if you've done something wrong, is put you in isolation, right? And, and we've talked about it. Uh, you know, boy, as grandparents, uh, it's a new world. And, and uh, so if you have grandchildren, if you're blessed with them and so on, just uh, I don't know what, where it's come, but, you know, the younger group, uh, they, they do not believe in, in corporal punishment at all. And I've wondered about that. How do you get kids to listen? Well, th Dylan, it's a fate worse than death for his mother to say time out. Those two words are just killers. Time out. Oh, no. You know, but it, it does. It, it's it's you're separate from the family, and and that's important. It, unless you don't have a conscience at all, and, and then I guess you have to be locked up. But but uh, you know that just that, that whole uh, concept of, of isolation and so on. And and as I look at the scripture, but what I want to share with you is is the gospel. You know that Paul writes in Romans today is that we do not have condemnation because Jesus took it all on. I want you to think about it just on that thought of pain and isolation. On the cross, Jesus experienced and endured both. Just think of the pain of the cross, right? And, and yet he took that all for our sake. And the isolation, you, ex you experience it when he said the words, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the theologians, they, they take it so far, and I, I'm taking them just a little bit further. They'll say, our sins were on Jesus, and it separated him from God. So God, in a sense, had forsaken his own son because of our sins. And, and just think of that, the forsakenness, the aloneness of, of on the cross. The, the unity that, that Jesus knew with, with the, the Trinity and so on. It, Beyond our understanding, I guess. I'm just sharing that with you for you to think about. That aloneness Jesus endured so we would never have to experience it in our lives. No matter what you've gone through and as alone as you feel, you're never alone. Because Jesus has taken that all on. And yet, dear ones, I want to share with you that it's still a part of us. It's a part of us in an evil way as well as in our shame. Let me share with you what I mean by that. If, if you pay attention to our culture today, it, it's known as the cancel culture. It should be known as the forgiving culture, but it's the cancel culture. What do they mean by the cancel culture? If you do things that are not acceptable today, you're canceled. You don't want to be canceled, but you are. They'll find your house. They'll burn you out. They'll do anything that, that is needed to get rid of you. Who of us is without sin that cannot be canceled? We need forgiveness, right? And so whatever that it is that's wrong with our society today that needs to be corrected and improved upon, I know that. But none of us needs to be canceled. Jesus comes into the world. The scripture is so clear on that. Who, that, who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. No matter, dear ones, no matter what you do, Jesus doesn't cancel you, although you deserve it. He forgives you so that you have another chance at life. Now, that doesn't get rid of the commandments. That doesn't change the things so that the things that used to be right now are wrong and the things that used to be wrong are right. It doesn't change any of that. It forgives. Jesus has paid the price so that we're forgiven. My goodness, I, I asked God to give me a, a, an illustration and, and the one he gave to me is a silly one. Uh, I think it's silly. You'll probably think it's even sillier than I do. But it's the best I could come up with just to, to point out that whole thing of, of with our culture today, it, it's, it's so flip-flopped, right? The, the things that, that are wrong are now right, and the things that are right that, that should be accepted are now wrong, and so on. So, so we know that, and it'll come in on itself.
The evil destroys itself, but how many people does it take along with it? That you would know that. If suddenly I gave up the sermon today, and I'd, I'd say, you know, uh, what we need uh, in the terms of the announcements is uh, just a little bit of the things here. You know, back in the 1600s and so on, those Catholics, uh, they, they bothered us Lutherans. And, and I think it's finally time to make them pay for all those past sins. So now we want to have a, a bombing unit that finds the Catholic churches to blow them up. And if you can't blow them up, then we loot them. Eventually, you, it's pastor, I, I, I don't know if you should be saying that. <laughs> well, what's the matter? You, you check, no, it's not right, is it? Correct. It's not right to be saying those kinds of things. And so we know that, you know? And, and, and so if, if that's one from history, that, that's silly. But from history, you know, it, we need to speak up at the beginning times. In the 1920s, the 1930s, the, in Germany, there rose a leader. And, and everybody, you know, kind of, well, he's a little different. Well, I, I just need Czechoslovakia. The, and, and and do you remember the newsreels? I, I trust the, that you went through that in school just like I did. Chamberlain, the prime minister of Britain, said, we got peace because we had to give up Czechoslovakia, but it's, it's, that's it. The devil never quits. And, and, and so for us too, that when, when we live with that canceled culture, without forgiveness, it never ends. Because you know that person deserves more punishment than what they got. You know it. Okay? And, and so that's the first thing, and I'll quit there. I, the, the rest, the Lord has to work with you on that. That's, that's what he worked with me on, just in that thing. The second one is more personal, and, and, and it's our shame. You know, it, we live in a, a cancel culture. We live in a world that, that's very tough to be a Christian in right now. But sometimes we're tough on ourselves. We can't forgive ourselves. We're the ones that want to cancel ourselves because of all the things that have gone wrong in our lives, all the pain that we're going through. And don't you do it. That's what Paul is saying. Don't you ever quit because God will never quit on you. And the little personal story, some of you may not know her story, the little, that beautiful little gal, Canadian gal, Shania Twain. I don't know if you've ever heard her music, but, but uh, she, she was born in the province where I was born. So I know that country, it's rugged. But if you like the North Woods, Shania and I both, we, we, we were born in that, that type of country. Uh, and, and it's interesting, just her story to be so humble, so humbling. You know, New Orleans had, uh, had a, a hurricane a while back and uh, uh, people, you know, the, it had broken stores and so on, music stores. And, and uh, just a cute but a humiliating type of a thing. People would rob from the music stores. They would steal the CDs. Well, somebody reported, they shouldn't have reported, that, that one music store had no CDs left except Shania Twain CDs. <laughs> in, in that, in that, I, that's humiliating, you know? But, you know, the, do you, just, you just think New Orleans, jazz and everything, and Shania, it makes sense, doesn't it? Uh -huh. Okay, well, Shania Twain, you might think that she was a privileged gal. I mean, she's got a beautiful voice. Uh, she's, she's a country star. They, 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 they respect her like anything. No, not if you know her story. I don't know if you know her story. Shania Twain, uh, her mother uh, was a native, an Indian, and she married her father, and he drank too much and abused her. And as if that wasn't enough, one day they were driving in their truck and they were sideswiped, both were killed. Janiya was the one that had to raise the family. She was the oldest, and she did. She put her dreams, her singing on, on hold and raised the kids. When the last one was gone, she, she went back, went to Toronto and auditioned and so on, and, and uh, she made it. Um, 
So that was her first test in life. Well, you might think she paid her dues, right? And now it'd be easy sailing. Well, okay, it was pretty good. She got married uh, to a producer, a songwriter, and uh, he was good. Uh, Robert was his first name. They called him Mutt, uh, the good name uh, for him because that's what he turned into be. And, and uh, she had a friend, uh, Anna Marie, and uh, they would get together and Shania wasn't sure. And so one day she confided in her friend. She says, I'm not sure about Mutt. She says, I love him so much, but, but something's not right. Uh, we're not the way that we used to be. And wouldn't you know it, Anna Marie, her best friend, was having an affair with her husband. And it humiliated Shania, personally as well as publicly. She was not making, now in Hollywood, many people would say, well, Let's get the photographers in. Let's make a big deal. This, so this, Shania wasn't made that way. This is not the way that it should be. As well as you can't hide. Everybody knows. Everybody is smirking. And, and so it was awful. And she writes years later, that just to go along with that girl, she begged Anna Marie. She says, I'll do anything. She wrote her letter. She says, I'll do anything for you if you just give me back my husband. And it was not meant to be. And so the pain, what do you do with the pain from that? Well, Shania found somebody to get married to that truly loved her. But it had to be somebody that would know the pain. And it was her best friend's ex-husband. I don't know what you do with that. <laughs> they knew the pain, yeah. didn't they? You might be thinking of scandal or no. They would visit with each other and their kids were hurt. And eventually they learned to love one another. And they got married. And dear ones, I want you to know that B loves one of the scriptures where it says, you will comfort others with the same comfort you yourself have known. And so, dear ones, I want you to give it to God. Whatever pain you've been going through this last week or this last year. You know, I, I think in our lives, right? Just as we're think, thinking of C.S. Lewis, all the things I think our lives will be, for me, 1949, 1950, 1951, insignificant. Go to school. 2020, that's the year. Isn't it? This is the one we're going to put down in the diary that we're going to remember. But why? Because it was painful. Nothing but pain. Jobs, viruses, unrest in our country. Is our country going to last? Right down the line. We'll remember this year. So whatever things are in your memory bank already, give it to God so he can turn even the worst pain into a blessing. I am so mindful that my words need to be encouraging. And, and so if I can share, I hope in, in an encouraging way, we all have a cross. It's the pain in our lives. But you know, God wants us to give that cross back to him so that he can use it for a blessing. The story is told of a Christian who had a dream and uh, she went to heaven and uh, she had her cross with her which was all her troubles and she went into a big room and the angels were there and they said you know we'd like to trade you your cross if you want to trade it for another one we have all sorts of crosses of people here that have lived that they'd be willing to trade you and so she looked at the other crosses and some of them looked really good but underneath there were all sorts of thorns you know, sometimes lives of other people seem so good until you, oh, I don't want that cross. And then there were crosses that were hideous right from the beginning. And, and she didn't see them. On the other side, there was a rainbow. But they were hideous. And so as she looked at all the crosses, her, her eyes went around. And, you know, that cross over there doesn't look so bad. Can you give me that one? The angel said, sure, I think we can do that. You realize, though, that's the cross 
you came in with. <laughs> and, and isn't that our lives? And that would be my word of encouragement. You know, other people seem to be more privileged. Other people seem to get away with more than we do. It's not so. But whatever cross God has given to you, the scripture reminds me that when you give it back to him, he will turn it into a blessing, the blessing of eternal life in Jesus' name. Until we get there, we share that forgiveness and that hope with one another. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Yeah.